Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Granite Rock's final installment of our 2022 Tech Talk seminar series. My name is Keith Severson. I'll be your host today. For everyone's information, we are, in fact, recording this today. That way we can grant uh, access to folks that weren't able to join us or go back and, and use this as reference. We will be sending out an ever popular uh, exit survey, which uh, really is intended to help us make these series better for you, the listener, and uh, more informative. So please tell us uh, what you liked, what works, and what you might like to see in the future. We'll go find the experts like the expert we have today to talk about any of the topics that are uh, uh, top of mind and burning uh, in your world as we get started, we uh, remind everybody, of course, to keep yourselves muted and your cameras off. The chat is open. We certainly encourage questions or comments throughout the meeting. We've got monitors that are going to be watching that, so Brandon doesn't have to watch that, but we will get those questions out there. If you happen to have a question, please add it to the chat, and we'll, we'll answer as soon as possible. We'll also watch for raised hands if you want to you wanna do it in, uh, in person yourself. So now it's a real pleasure to introduce Brandon Millar. He's going to be addressing uh, Caltrans SuperPave, Agency SuperPave. And uh, uh, Brandon is the Director of Technical Services for the California Pavement Association and a licensed civil engineer in California. Mr. Millar received his Bachelor of Science degree in uh, civil engineering from Cal Poly. In his current role, he works with Ash asphalt pavement industry and owner agencies throughout California and has been uh, a leader in the industry for over 25 years. Uh, working on all things asphalt, as he says, um, and uh, today probably we, we were fortunate to get him off the golf course because it was raining. So um, it's, uh, I'm glad you're here with us, Brandon. Um, so why don't you go ahead and, and tell us about uh, super pave hot mix asphalt, local government specifications, and then the second one will be Caltrans super pave specifications. Mr. Millar. Good morning to you, Keith. Good morning to everyone that's joining us today. Um, thank you all for, for taking time out of your day to, uh, to be here and join us and um, for this uh, nice little discussion we're going to have uh, related to um, asphalt pavements, how they're how the mixes are designed in this state, and um, some ways for for all of us can um, help and utilize um, similar strategies together to really help um, the efficiency of what we do and why we do it. I'm going to touch on that in just a little bit. Let's let's go ahead and get going. Keith, I'm assuming everything looks good on the screen. Yes, sir. It looks great. Excellent. All right. We're going to talk. We're going to have a discussion first about designing asphalt mixes. But first, for those of you who um, I haven't had the good pleasure of, of meeting before and aren't familiar with our association, um, we are a mix. Uh, an asphalt um, pavement association, uh, and we are uh, focused on promoting asphalt, providing learning opportunities about asphalt, advocating for asphalt's use, especially with regulatory and, and our legislative bodies, and then also looking at ways for all of you as stakeholders in our asphalt business um, to get together and meet each other, uh, develop working relationships, share experiences, really to, to increase the knowledge of everyone around us in the industry and um, also make it a little bit easier for us to interact um, when we start, when we actually get out there on projects. So with that, we need to understand, um, we're going to start off today by understanding the asphalt mixture. Now, there are, as most of you know, there are different different ways to design an asphalt mix, and and really quickly, let's let's get your little uh, let's get everyone's hands going on there on the keypad, and really quickly, go ahead and type into your into the chat box what design mix design methodology do you typically use on your projects? Do you use the super pave? Do you use Veeam, or do you use Marshall mix? 
or something other, something other. So just go ahead and really quickly, really quickly tap that in. I want I'm, I'm just curious as to to what you what everyone is using out there today. Okay, listening for a little, listening for those. So I got a 2010 Caltrans. I've got a Veeam plus SuperPave moving to SuperPave. Yep. Yep, I see all that in the chat. Okay. The, 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 the beauty of this question, there are no right answers. There are no wrong answers, right? Um, and and so that's what we're we're, we're going to go. We're, we're, we're to get a feel, and you can also get a feel what everyone else is doing. I think one of the one of the things we should keep in mind, and I was just on a on a call a little bit earlier today um, with some Caltrans upper managers, and one of the things we, we've been we've been discussing is sustainability in this state, um, climate stewardship, sustainability, and one of the things that comes up is how can we become more sustainable and more efficient in everything that we do and. Some some of that efficiency in let's say a region is really having everyone on the same page in regards to um, their operations, their specifications, the materials that they use. Um, so that's why you know we for for those of you we've been a Veeam state for for many many decades. I mean Francis Veeam, the the engineer over at Caltrans who developed the design methodology back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, that's been that's been our workhorse, but we've moved over, especially in Caltrans, over to SuperPave. So what we're going to do here is we're going to spend um, some time here discussing what is that SuperPave for those of you in the Veeam world. What does that SuperPave look like? And for those of you also who do SuperPave, um, the second part of this uh, of our discussion today will probably apply more to you um, in regards to what's the most efficient and effective way to utilize. Um, the methodology that is super paved. So let's just go over asphalt mixtures. You know, when we think about what do we want to do with an asphalt, what's the purpose of the asphalt mix mixture? You know, we're looking for something that's durable, something, a, a, a material that's going to be resistant to traffic and climate uh, that's going to hold up um, when the weather's really hot, the weather's really cold. Um, also safety, you know, one of the things that we want to make sure we do with our with our um, roadways is make sure that they're going to keep the cars on the road. Roadway friction, keeping that friction there, especially during environmental events. Just think about, you know, when we when we drive our roads, the benefits of you using an open graded friction course on our interstates, on our highways and even on our arterials, allowing that water to to. Kind of permeate into the mix. And then, and then, and then, um, release off the side of the mix as opposed to creating sheet and then, um, resulting in hydroplaning. What else do we look for? Comfortable ride. Well, that's smoothness. That's really where smoothness comes in. A very bumpy road is not, is not very good, not just for the, um, for our behind sitting in a seat. It's also not good for the efficiency of a vehicle. Uh, we we have many research studies that have been out there that show that when we have a smoother road, that vehicles will will operate more efficiently. It it increases the the fuel economy of the vehicles, so it's better for for everyone um, to have our smooth roads. And then we also have to look at this and um, need to make sure that our Asphalt pavement is also cost effective. It's a cost effective pavement um, from both uh, constructability and also the overall life of that pavement. So let's let's think about this from a um, what it's what it's trying to do, and let's go over some of the distresses um, that really keep that pavement from doing what its intended purpose is. I know most of you. Um, have heard about this, have seen this in action, especially for local agencies around um, intersections, um, and it's rutting, it's deformation of the of the pavement surface. What are the causes of that? You know, it's heavy loads, um, shearing. So this is really when you look at an intersection, uh, it could be the the shearing, the stopping and starting, 
um, putting a, a shear pressure onto that, that thin upper surface of the pavement. Also, we can see temperature temperature playing a role in it, uh, a temperature increase. So, you know, like the picture is showing, the temperature playing a role in actually changing the characteristics of the mix, the characteristics of the binder that's holding that mix together. And then an, another another thing um, that we will see is related to structural failure. So one of the things we have to keep in mind is just because the pavement fails, it's not always the pavement itself. It could be what's, what's going on beneath it too. But some things that we can do in our design is we can take the, this uh, rutting into account in our designs. And what do we do? We have different ways to account for that in our, in our mixed designs. And that's through either the type of binder that we use, the grade modifications to the binder, some of the aggregate characteristics, um, obviously binder content, and even the in-place in compaction during construction. So those all play a role in rutting. Um, and those are things that our mixed designs um, can help us um, address early on in our, in our construction process. Another one that we see is uh, durability and primarily on fatigue. Let's look at the fatigue side of the durability um, concern. And this is really caused by, you know this, truck, heavy truck traffic, heavy bus traffic, just very heavy traffic where you have, um, you know, it's like when you have a uh, paper clip and you take the paper clip and you bend it back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, it, it holds up pretty well, but you eventually get to a point where you cause that, you know, for all of you uh, engineers out there, you cause that that little piece of uh, of metal to fatigue, to yield and eventually break. And that's essentially what's happening here with, with the asphalt pavement. Because it's a flexible pavement, over time that that cyclic loading will will eventually cause it to to um, to to break. And so that's things that we can also address during during our design. Are there ways that uh, we can affect the overall mix. If we're dealing with um, fatigue in a very thin layer, maybe we look at softer binder type mixes. Think of asphalt rubber, for example, very resilient, very flexible mix that we put in thin lifts. Those are ideal to address uh, fatigue cracking in asphalt pavements. Also, we can affect it by binder content. Obviously, if we put more binder in it, more flexibility uh, of that mix. And then also we can look at um, the density too, is more density um, really having a nice, uh, um, a good way to keep that, that mix from, even though it's flexing, but to keep it, um, keep it to hold together and to counter that flexing. Then we also have another type of, of uh, durability related to thermal cracking. And really this is, uh, we see this, especially in the high desert, We'll see this in um, the foothills or even in the uh, Sierra Nevada and, and some other areas where we have a lot of extreme temperature changes. So as it gets hot and cold, that pavement is going to want to expand and contract. And so what's happening is, is as it starts to um, expand, all the particles are all pushing together in the acid. And so really, it's really the, the rock particle interaction that's keeping it. Um, but as all of a sudden you you contract, those rock particles are now pulling apart from each other. And what do you have? You have the the binder that's really in play there to um, to mitigate that thermal cracking. So that's another thing we can look at in mixed design considerations by the type of binders we use, the binder content, and obviously with in place density. Some other things that we want to look at also for pavement distresses. That would be raveling, bleeding. Um, also, these are things that we can address. We can we can um, we can mitigate it as part of our mixed design process. So obviously, we want to start from the beginning of with all of you know is um, I'm very familiar with is what's in the mix. What do we have? And there are really. Um, for, you know, I, I look at this as four primary um, constituents of our asphalt mixes. Um, your aggregate, which is about 95% of the mix, your binder, the, the asphalt binder in the mix, that's the glue that's holding it all together. 
We have mineral fillers and performance additives. So, so let's go a little bit more into detail. I know for a lot of you out there, you're 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 looking to say, I get this, I understand. That's good because um, this is all just building on to so that you can can understand what does that super pave really mean and what what controls do we have in our super pave for the to to really fine tune that that mix to really what we need in the field. And so where are the aggregates coming from? Um, you're all very familiar with this and, um, you know, they can come from a quarry similar to what granite rock has uh, down in Aromas, uh, a rock quarry. You'll also see alluvial um, aggregate sources. Think of those as, uh, for those of you in the, in the Bay Area, um, that would be like if you go out towards Pleasanton, Livermore, where you see the aggregate company is out there, or even in Sunol, um, those are primarily alluvial type deposits. And even that when you look at the aggregates that are being shipped in from, from uh, Canada, those are also from alluvial deposits. They all have can have different, um, different mineralogies as well. Um, one of the things to think about when we when we, you know, quarry versus alluvial, um, quarry is that hard rock. They're typically in mountainous areas. One of the great things about those rocks is that they are completely crushed, 100% cross, crushed rock. Um, but there are some um, challenges also that they have to deal with um, uh, related to uh, the consistency on some quarries um, in their, uh, in their uh, quarry. Um, the consistency of the rock, or maybe even some some veins of some soft material, just depends on on, on where that quarry is located. Um, then you have alluvial sands, sand and gravel beds. Hey, it, they're they're great because they're in riverbeds. Sometimes a lot of the um, a lot of the softer aggregates have already been broken down. You get can have some really good quality aggregates out of sand and gravel, but they're all rounded. Um, so what has so there's a lot more effort that needs to go um, to make sure that we that the that the suppliers can um, process those materials, crush those materials, uh, really to meet uh, the requirements of our mixes. Aggregate characteristics. So this is something that we need to look at when we look at our asphalt mixes. What are the aggregate characteristics that we are looking for? Toughness. Um, you're looking at an aggregate and its abil and the ability for it to break down under different types of wear scenarios. Um, angularity, that's really where the structure of an asphalt mix comes from. The more angular the material is, uh, you'll have a lot more um, uh, uh, coarse aggregate friction that will increase that structural um, capacity of that, of that pavement. Um, that's why I mentioned before in regards to a river source where you're going to have a lot of rounded rocks, those will tend to internally slip over each other. Um, if you have something that's angular, they tend to lock in. You know, we call that interlocking of the aggregates. Also, we look at characterization of the fine component of the mix. So we're looking here at sand equivalents, which is kind of giving us an idea of the proportioning of sand to clay-like materials. And then if we feel that we have um, a concern with the, the characterization of those very, very fine materials, then we can do some plastic, plasticity index on them to really quantify how much of this is actual clay versus how much of it is just very, very fine dust. So that may not be clay-like. The other, the other uh, material that we use in our asphalt mixes are binders. And so they are a petroleum-based product. They're manufactured uh, through a distillation process at a refinery. If any of you have, have driven over by Benicia, um, Richmond, you've seen those refineries. And really it's distillation. What are they really doing? They're taking that crude oil that comes out of the ground and for all intents and purposes, they're boiling it. And then they're capturing the different components as they rise up through a tower um, and and separating out the different the different types of um, uh, petroleum based components. So asphalt becomes one of those products that they are able to to um, to get in that process. 
Now, the, the nice thing about it is, is that the way the processes have been become more efficient, they are now able to manufacture asphalt binders uh, that can meet the various needs and desires of our pavements. So this is through engineering those binders to different grades, which we'll touch here in a second, but also being able to modify them as well um, to get various characteristics. So, and obviously, as we all know, when we look at an asphalt binder, one of the nice things about using it in asphalt mixes is we can go ahead and at high temperatures, you're talking about 300 plus degrees Fahrenheit, that asphalt binder becomes very liquid. So we can go ahead and mix it up into a mixture, but then in its ambient conditions, in the temperatures and conditions that that pavement is going to see over its life, the asphalt binder for all intents and purposes remains solid. So um, that's really one of the nice, uh, the nice characteristics of this binding agent. So now we look at the grading and, and for all of you who are familiar and those of you who, who were around in the mid 2000s will remember when we switched from the previous grading methodology to the performance graded methodology. And all of those numbers mean something when you see it and when you specify it. Now, if you look at the on the left there, that's a table of the state of California. This is straight out of the Caltrans Highway Design Manual as to where, where to specify um, the binders for, for your asphalt pavements. And so you'll see ranges from a 64 minus 10 to a 70 minus 10. Um, the numbers mean something. The first number that you see is your seven day average high temperature in the pavement. Um, so keep that in mind that, and these are all in degrees Celsius. And then the next number, which is a minus 28, that's the low temperature expected in the pavement. So that means that the way the binder is tested using a, um, a dynamic, dynamic shear rheometer, DSR, don't worry about that. We, we, we can go over that um, in more detail in another, in another venue. But the way it's tested, it imparts a different type of characteristic related to um, resistance to rutting. So that high temperature is really a stiffness value of the binder. And that low temperature really tells us more about its um, ability to withstand cracking in low temperatures. So that's when you look at across the state, we are in a fairly mild state. We see um, fairly uh, higher uh, low temperature numbers than you may see across the country. I think across the country, most most states are using a, a 64 minus 22. Um, but that's why when we get up into the um, Sierras, you'll see that minus 28. And then if you see a letter at the end of that grade, that just gives us an idea on, on modification. So for the Caltrans section 92 binders, you'll see an M and that means it's modified. And what is modified means? Um, typically we, we see modification in California with two primary modifiers. Uh, we see the uh, modifiers with um, polymers and modifiers with ground tire rubber, um, asphalt rubber for, for many of you. That would be the, the modification that's done at the hot plant. Um, and then also you see the, the uh, polymer modifiers just some general rules of thumb in regards to um, what you would when you would anticipate modification being needed. Also within Caltrans, they look for an elastic recovery. So really what this is, is let's go ahead and take a sample of that binder. Let's stretch that binder all the way out. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to, um, after we stretch it, we're gonna cut it in the middle and let's see how much it goes back. Um, and so that we get sort of a feel for elasticity of that binder, which will give us um, a better understanding of how it's gonna perform in those low temperature environments. We talked about mineral fillers and some of you are wondering, well, what, what kind of mineral fillers are we gonna use in these? Really what they are is when we get into the design, there may be a need to um, adjust the gradation um, or add mineral fillers to affect um, the air void of the mix, right? So um, that's that's primarily what they used for. 
mineral fillers could be um, the fines from a bag house that are used. Um, sometimes the, that's a generation for it. Uh, they could be um, lime, for example, which is sometimes used for moisture susceptibility. Could be a zeolite for that's all, sometimes used for warm mix asphalt. But primarily, the focus of a mineral filler is really related to um, uh, using another material to help get us the the goal of our mixed gradation and, and um, air void requirements. And then obviously we have the performance additives, the not so magic elixirs. I say not so magic because they're not magic. These are engineered chemicals that are designed to impart a specific characteristic in the binder or the mix overall. And, you know, they have been key to, to being able to achieve some great things in the performance of our pavements. For example, like warm mix asphalt, where we're able to significantly reduce the temperature. Um, so what is, why are we able to reduce the temperature? Because the warm mix asphalt additives um, help us uh, by, by changing the mixture characteristics when it gets into a lower temperature range. So where a mix may not be compactable at 200 degrees, I mean, at, at May, may need to be at about two to 250 in order to compact it. With a warm mix asphalt, we might be able to drop that down into the 250 to 275 range. I mean, 150 to 175 instead of the two to 250. So we're starting to see those. We also have rejuvenators and softening agents. Those are very key for us to help us increase the amount of uh, wrap that we're going to, to discuss next, amount of wrap that we can use in our mixes and still get the performance characteristics that we're trying to achieve. We also have anti strips that helps us in regard to moisture sensitivity of the material, making sure that the rock in the binder, when they are exposed to a lot of moisture, uh, maintain that bond together. And then obviously fibers, which helps increase the tensile strength of the, of the overall uh, mix, which can also help to reduce cracking and also um, make it uh, more flexible um, as another way of another type of performance additive. Now, I didn't put this in the original one in, in the in the beginning because when we talk about wrap and and for those of you who were here a couple of weeks ago when we when we had a wrap discussion, um, that was really good to give you an over, I, overall idea of really what's encapsulated um, in these images. Um, but really, what we're doing, what what this is, is it's essentially aggregate and asphalt that comes out of a pavement. So it's milled out of the pavement, like the top left, comes out. It's processed in the top right into a uniform material that includes both aggregate and asphalt binder, and then that's run and put into a hot plant where it is incorporated with some uh, some virgin aggregate some brand new asphalt binder from the refinery, and then it's all mixed together and then placed so that we are able to increase the recycle content in our asphalt mixes, which reduces the demand for um, aggregate materials in the state, for binder materials in this state. It allows us to become more sustainable in our, and more efficient with the use of our limited natural resources. So let's put this all together. So we now have, you know, we're, we know what we're trying to do with this mix. We want to make sure that it's that it's going to perform the way we want it to perform. We have all of the different components that we use in the mix. So how how what are what are the decisions? What are the process? What's the process that we're going to use to put all of that together um, so that so that we can get a performing pavement? So really. What we're doing in this, and we talked about this in the beginning in regards to cracking and uh, fatigue cracking, thermal cracking, and deformation, rutting. When you look at the two curves, the stability curve is kind of like your rutting curve. Your durability curve, that's your cracking curve. And what you find is as you increase your, um, as you increase the amount of asphalt that you have in your combination of aggregates, it's going to affect its durability and stability. And usually what we try to do in our designs is find something that sort of hits the sweet spot to maximize the amount of durability and to maximize the amount of stability. 
And as you can see, that's really putting us in a, in a place where we're in that, um, in that crossover zone. That's really what we're trying to do in, in, in our mixes. And when you look at all of our uh, mix design methodologies, whether they're Marshall, Veeam, or Superpave, it's all trying to achieve this same balance. So let's look at the diagram of the mix. This is really the key to uh, the Superpave uh, methodology for design. And we're gonna compare, compare that to Veeam, what you already look at, but this is really what we're doing is, um, we wanna go ahead and design, um, really focus on air voids. Uh, we wanna understand, we wanna design a mix that will have, compacted mix that will have a certain percentage of air voids in that mix. Um, unfortunately, we can't grab a sample of air and measure it. We don't, we can't measure the mass of it. But what we can do is we can measure the volume of it. So, but but all of the materials that we have, whether it's the binder or the aggregates, the mineral filler, all of that, all of those items, we know what the mass is, right? And it's and so what we need to do is, and finding the volume of it is difficult because they're not a uniform, easily to understand material. Think of it from an aggregate. What do they have? They have uh, rough surfaces, they have pores. You know, we one of the big things that we do when we look at aggregate characteristics is absorption, right? So we know the mass, but it's hard for us to really get at the volume. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure out these materials by mass. We're gonna then, then convert those over to a volume so that then when we put it all together, we can, uh, we can compare it with the volume of the air that we're trying to achieve. So the, the important way for us to do that is to look at this mass to volume relationship, which is the specific gravity. So we have different ways of measuring the mass. And now we have a couple of tests that are going to help us understand what that specific gravity of the unit of the of the material is. Now we can take all of our items from the mass side, right, and move it over to the volume side, and then boom, we can see how we compare with our with our air voids. So this is all really key to superpave. And for those of you who are wondering where did superpave come from. There you go, superior performing asphalt pavements, super pave. This was part of a, a strategic highway research program that was done in the early 90s. Uh, we started to see adoption of super pave in the mid, mid and late 90s across the country. Um, obviously, for, for those of you who've been in California your whole time, we didn't really start to incorporate super pave into our design methodologies until mid 2010s so it was in the 2015 standard spec book but we had started to uh, caltrans started to do some pilot projects a little bit before that so i think it's important to note what is super pave um it is a process for determining the proportions of all of these uh, materials that we're going to use in our mix determining those proportions that will result in a mix that meets those requirements uh, um, that we need for its use in the field. I want to emphasize super pave is not a specific mix. Um, we've often heard where they say, oh, I don't want to use the Caltrans book because I don't want to use super the I don't want to use super pave. Well, super pave, there's nothing wrong with the mix design methodology. Um, I think what we're going to learn a little bit later is um, is probably really what it is. It's not about the, the mix methodology. It's more about the decisions that Caltrans made in regards to the characteristics that they're looking for for the mix that they're using. Now, I think it's important to note too that when we look at SuperPave, there are many similarities uh, to the other mix design methodologies. I mean, when we look at all of these methodologies, what are we going to do? We're going to figure out what is our materials. We're going to put together those materials. Um, we're going to look at that aggregate structure of the materials. We're going to put that together. 
Then we're going to compact the material, all the, all the components together compacted to determine what's the best amount of the proportions of the materials to meet um, certain criteria from air void standpoint here at Superpave. And then we're also gonna then do some testing of it, of the completed mix to ensure that it's going to perform the way we want it to perform in the field. So first we're gonna select the materials. This number one thing is, is probably the one thing most uh, everyone needs to keep in mind in all in everything that we do. It's um, the key word there is representative sample. It's not as simple as just grabbing a shovel, going out somewhere, um, sticking it in a pile of something and, and um, throwing it in a bag and, and heading off. Um, we have to be very deliberate in how we gather samples in the field. So this means in order to get representative samples, we need to follow the procedures that are already outlined in like methodologies like CT125, R47, whatever the methodology we're gonna use for sampling the materials and preparing the materials. We need to make sure that we follow those as closely as possible because I'll tell you, you can do the, you can have the best testing um, program ever um, but the results don't mean anything if your samples aren't representative. So let's go ahead and make sure that we gather the representative samples for the mix that we're designing for. Um, then we're going to go ahead and uh, make sure the designer is going to say, all right, I'm using these aggregates. Um, I'm going to use maybe they have a couple of different binder so, so sources that they could use, or maybe there's one. So they'll you know, have that as, a, as something to consider. Then they'll start to look at if I take all my aggregates, do um, the, the composite uh, material characteristics meet the specification? Those kind of characteristics would be like your crush count, durability, those types of things that we're looking at. And then also thinking about, all right, um, if I need warm mix, what am I going to use? What about moisture sensitivity? Do I need to incorporate a liquid anti-strip or lime? Those types of things uh, then also come into play just for the for the initial material selection. Then there's the designing the aggregate structure. So now what they're going to do is say, okay, look, I've got these aggregates. Um, this is the way my plant is set up. And these are the stockpiles of, of the different aggregate um, gradations that I'm gonna proportion to have my combined aggregate gradation. So let's look. How can I um, how can I meet these uh, our air void requirements, our mixture void requirements with the aggregates that I have available here? So then they also want to look at not just I can do different proportions of each, but also if they when they're running it through the plant, huh? Um, how do they make sure that they keep everything in balance? That the way that they're feeding the plant with the with the cold feed aggregates, whether it's with a belt of material or if it's a loader that's running between stockpiles, keeping those at a at a level so they don't run out and then um, running it through the plant efficiently. So those are the types of things that the designer then is going to look at from an aggregate structure standpoint. Then comes the big one, the binder content determination. So now we've got the aggregates, we've selected all those aggregated and all of our component materials. Now we're going to create some trial mixes, and typically what we'll do is uh, we'll add, we'll take those those mixes, and we'll add different percentages of of asphalt binder to those to those mixes to that to that aggregate gradation that we've, we've we we're going to go out for our trial. We're going to compact them, and then once we're do once we're done compacting them, then we're going to go ahead and determine uh, the volumetric properties. Um, and see which is going to be our ideal binder content for that aggregate gradation. So for, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with the gyratory compactor, essentially that's a typical pine machine on the left. That's for the primary um, compactors that we see here in California. And what do we do? We have a specimen in a cylinder. So that's really a six inch diameter mold. And then it's put up at an angle and then that thing rotates. And then there's a pressure head that drops down on that. Um, 
And so as it rotates, pressure is being applied for a certain number of gyrations. So you put the mix in there, you hit go, and it'll turn, spin, and pressure is being applied. That pressure and that spinning, that turning motion is really meant to simulate what's happening out in the field in that you have a roller that's that's rolling back and forth over a pavement putting pressure and, and putting pressure down onto that asphalt mix um, so that's really what what we're doing here um, in the case of a veam for those of you familiar with the v mix design uh, those are using um, a similar a four inch diameter mold uh, that's also rotating and then you have a vertical um, foot that's that's being pushed down as it rotates. The shape of the foot provides a kneading action that simulates also field compaction. And then for those of you familiar with Marshall, you're just taking this giant weight and just dropping it from a certain height um, vertically uh, so many times uh, to compact the specimen. So it's purely just a vertical um, impact onto that into onto that mix. So key thing for a gyratory compactor is uh, gyrations. Um, how many times do we want to spin this under that pressure? How many times do we want to have this um, cylinder of material spin? Um, so what that is is it's designed. Uh, it's an it's nomenclature is in design. So that's the number of gyration for design. And so really that's looking at. Um, what do we anticipate the air voids, as you can see, to be about halfway through the design life? So if you've designed a 20-year 20 20-year 20 pavement, we should be at a certain air voids at um, 10 years. That's, what, that's really what our end design is telling us. And obviously, N initial and N max are both the one end and to the other end of, of the spectrum of that, of that pavement. Keep that in mind when we start to look at gyrations there. So once we've gone ahead and, and, and we've now um, compacted that specimen, the, the, the different trial mixes, and now we can start to, and, and we've done some uh, uh, volumetric analysis on those mixes. Now we can start to develop our charts um, that really compare our air voids to our binder content. We look at our VMA at the binder content, VFA, dust proportion at the binder contents. And what we're really here trying to do is really narrow down to um, what is our air void target in our, in our specification for that project. Typically it's 4%. And then what's the percent binder? Does it meet all the VMA requirements? VF, does it meet all those other requirements at that binder content? If for some reason it doesn't, we may have to go back and and reproportion or or do some uh, modifications to the aggregate side, um, or maybe look at another range of binder contents. But that's typically what we're doing with the with the super pave. When people ask what's the difference between super pave and 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 veam, the reality is we're still doing the same thing. We're still compacting the mix. We're compacting it in a little bit of a different way. And the reality is we're going to get different results in regards to binder contents from the two methodologies. But in the end, we're going to be getting the performing pavement that we want um, and that we require. Once we've gone ahead and, and completed um, that initial an analysis of, oh, my gosh, we've got our 4% air void uh, mixture completed. Um, here's the gradation. Here's the binder content. We're not done yet. So now this is where we're going to take that mixture and we're going to run some mixture tests on it. Uh, so we're going to now look at its resistance to, rock, to, to rutting, resistance to deformation. Um, and then also we're going to look at its resistance to uh, moisture damage. And so when we look at for the Caltrans specification, it's looking at both Hamburg wheel, um, which is in that, which is that picture that you see with the, with that running mark across the two the two specimens, and we're also going to look at T two eighty three for uh, moisture sensitivity. Uh, yeah, T two eighty three. Now, if we're looking at 
another option for a local agency specification. Um, that specific we'll talk about a little bit later. They're only going to look at um, Hamburg not necessarily T283 because we can get the same and we can get some really actually better information on the moisture sensitivity of a mix with, with the Hamburg wheel as well. So really it comes down to, you know, one of the key aspects of the super paved mix design. Um, what is it that we're really, uh, some things to think about when you look at um, the, the super paved mix design. One is uh, the mix requirements um, for the for the mix design. They're all based off of uh, um, your actual traffic environmental conditions. Uh, your traffic is captured in the um, thing that is your traffic is being captured in your gyrations, the number of gyrations. Because remember, I mentioned that you know the your end design is looking at air voids of the mix about halfway through the life. Because we know that when we started at at eight percent. Um, we want to be about halfway through the life, we want to be at 4% air, in place air voids, but we really don't want to go maybe below 2 or 3% at the end of life, right? So that's sort of how we're designing it. So we take into account the traffic um, through our um, gyrations. And then we also look at environmental conditions, and that's captured in, as I mentioned before, the asphalt binder itself, right? So how we grade the asphalt binder really helps us with um, environmental conditioning as well, the environmental condition it's gonna be in. Um, the other thing that we have with the super paved design is it's really providing a lot more flexibility in, in creating a mix uh, for our project conditions, for, for those field conditions. What we've seen when we look at between the super paved and the V-mix design is an increase in the in the grading bands, in the in the acceptable bands, we're not too worried about. You know, there's a thought that oh my gosh, you've incre in increased the the grading bands so much that you could drive a truck through it; they're meaningless. You can put anything you want out there, and it's and it's going to be accepted. And that's not what we want. Well, really, what it is is we're focusing on the volumetrics of the mix, not the gradation. So the control is on the volumetrics. So as a result. The wider grading bands is going to give us a, a lot more, um, give the designer a lot more flexibility to use the aggregate materials that are available to them to meet those volumetric that volumetric criteria. Now we've 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 come from a, a history where we've always said a higher nominal maximum aggregate size, so that is the essentially the largest size aggregate in your um, in your mixture, that the, the larger that is, um, the better resistance to deformation to rutting you will have. What we have found through many research studies um, over the past few decades, including the, the development of the super paid mix design, is that in the field, we are seeing that smaller nominal maximum aggregate size mixes and in some cases, even finer mixes, so ones that um, have a little bit more fines in them um, than we typically use, will meet the pavement performance criteria that we're looking for in the field under heavy loads. Uh, so what we're, and there's a couple of benefits of, of doing that. Number one, it, it helps us utilize our aggregate resources a lot better, a lot more efficiently um, by having the smaller ones. The other thing is from a constructability standpoint, it's it helps the contractor achieve the in-place density, which is really key to pavement for performance by having smaller nominal maximum, maximum aggregate size mixes. You have um, more space for the smaller aggregates to work within the mix to achieve their locking uh, their locking state uh, for compaction. And then also what we see with larger nominal maximum aggregate size mixes is that even when you get um, density, it's it's we could have an issue with overall permeability of the mix, um, which while it may be great for um, having those large aggregates may be great for overall stability, um, having a mix that has some permeability in it is detrimental to the overall performance 
uh, maybe even from a moisture sensitivity standpoint by actually capturing and trapping the moisture inside the mix. Now, up until this point, when we start to look at maybe our V mix design, we've controlled it by what? Our aggregate gradations and um, we just controlled what mix we were going to use by our aggregate gradations and just get 4% air voids. Uh, what we have here, and then we would use uh, stability, the Venus, the stabilometer. What we find is that really the stabilometer had not had a really good uh, correlation to pavement performance. It was a really good indication, but not necessarily a performance measure. And then the other part of it with the stability test is we saw high enough variability that became very problematic for, um, for field testing of material. One of the things that, that um, SuperPave that has been adopted today, it does incorporate a Hamburg test, which gives us a better indication of the rut resistance of the mix, as well as the moisture sensitivity of the mix too, because since the that Hamburg test is actually run in a um, bath of water, so it's it's a submerged uh, mix at at a at a roughly at a warm very warm temperature. Um, we're able to see how that mix performs um, when it's uh, when it's rutted and it's um, and it has some saturation and it, do we lose overall strength of the mix? So something to think about when we look at the comparison between the super pave and the veen. Um, different types of compaction. Um, in the super pave, really what's being specified in the, in the design in the project is, hey, we want, we want to mix with these materials characteristics. So that's the aggregates of the different component characteristics. Here's the, here's the, um, the number of gyrations you're going to use. That's our, um, our, our tie into our, um, our strength of the mix. And then we want this air void. I, I didn't put up there, but also a, a specific binder grade. And that, that goes to both of them. We don't talk about um, which aggregate gradation. We don't have to, we no longer have to specify under the super pave, the aggregate gradation that's used uh, because those now are actually addressed in the specification for construction section lift thicknesses. When we go to the Veeam, what are we specifying material characteristics? Yeah, we do that with the super pave. But here now we would say, okay, aggregate gradation. So what is the what is the criteria that's being used to determine should I use a three quarter inch, one inch, half inch, three eighths inch mix? Um, it's it's based off of you know something that we we're a mindset where we believe that the larger the rock, the better the the resistance to rutting it is. But that's not always the case. Um, and then also the air voids and the binder gradation. So here what we're doing is, is we're letting, you know, sort of that performance metrics. Here's our traffic conditions. Here's our environmental conditions. And then uh, mix designer, go ahead and, and, and create a mix that's cost effective and efficient for that situation. But something that we need to think about is um, overall, uh, and this goes back to that question in regards to what is super pave um, and what is the Caltrans standard specification design requirement. And the reality is super pave has a lot of flexibility in it in regards to um, controlling the gyrations for the use, for its use in regards to the traffic loading. Um, what Caltrans did when they adopted SuperPave is they said, okay, we're going to use this super gyratory process, but we need a mix that's going to work on our highways. So what does that look like? Well, we're going to go with a single gyration level at 85. Our air void targets at 4%. Um, the, the aggregate requirements, they uh, significantly increased the crush count. Of the of the mix because they figured that's going to help them. Really, what is Caltrans on the highways trying to do? Trying to keep their pavements from rutting. So that's really what their that one HMA type A mix is is a high heavy load, 
highway rut resistant mix. But we always ask ourselves, a lot of local agencies look at that mix and say, uh, I don't have that. What about local, what about residential road? What about a collector? How about counties that have low volume uh, routes or rural that see a cow and a truck a day? What about those? What's When we look at those types of roads, the failure is not always heavy traffic loads. The failure is typically environmental conditioning. It goes back to durability. It goes back to cracking, um, whether uh, primarily, you know, it could be fatigue over time or it could be, um, or it could be thermal, right? So how do we have a mix? How can we look at that super pave design methodology and um, apply it to those types of routes? So do you always have to follow the Caltrans Section 39? Many of you do, um, but I think there's something that we all realize at this point, um, especially with some recent developments that there is another. So we're gonna take a quick little break here and we're gonna talk about what that other option is in just a minute. So at this point, I'm gonna pause here for SuperPave and ask, do we have any questions out there for what we've, um, what, I've, what I've brought out there to share with all of you? Feel free to tap them in, um, tap, go ahead and ask the questions or raise your hand. Um, Keith can help with that as well. And um, while you're doing that, I just wanted to thought I'd take this little break to um, share with you all a couple things to think about this month. Um, this is April. So for all of you, as you're typing your questions, also remember that this is Distracted Driving Awareness Month. Um, asphalt roads are designed to help you drive safely, uh, but it's all of our responsibility to stay alert when we do that. That's our job. And so what we wanna do is make sure that everyone is aware that it is Distracted Driving Awareness Month and that we need to focus on finding ways uh, to keep the road safer for everyone. Um, and so what can we do to minimize our things that distract us while we're driving? So think about some of the things that when you're driving around, um, think about ways that you could help um, help yourself stay alert um, for the safety of you, the people that are in your vehicle, the people that are driving around you, and especially when we start to get into construction zones. So anybody have questions out there? That was that was very interesting. Also Friday, April yeah, 23rd is Earth Day. Uh, asphalt pavements are 100% reusable. So let's make them the sustainable pavement of choice not just on Friday, but every day. And then finally, April 28th, that's Workers Memorial Day. So uh, on, on, on April 28th, I think that's important for all of us to take a moment out of our day and to think about those uh, who we lost or who were injured on the job in our roadway work zones. Uh, we need to remember to practice uh, road safety while we're driving and we need to keep our road crews safe um, as they're out there delivering our top-notch asphalt routes, keeping our roads available for everyone. So I just want you all to, to think about that on, on April 20th, 28th. Think about the folks we, we've lost and those who have been injured and, and um, let's not forget, uh, forget to, to uh, make sure that we're safe when we're driving out there on the regular road, but especially become uh, uh, more aware of our surroundings when we get into construction work zones. Thank you for all of that, Brandon. Um, we don't have anything in the chat. I do have um, I do have some questions about warm mix that are uh, came in earlier. Um, I think I'll save those until you go through your next part and then, and I'll ask those at the, at the end of that. Well, we can do that. We can do the warm mix question now. Oh, okay. So we've got some questions, um, from Patrice who was unable to make it today. Yeah. And she wanted, she said, our inspectors would like to know what the recommended temperature ranges are for lay down 
breakdown roller, intermediate roller, and final roller. And uh, this is around warm mix super pave. Are there temperature ranges where the warm mix asphalt is tender and the rollers should stay off the mat? Wow, that's a good one. For those of you who um, who may not know, um, previously before coming back to the association, I used to work in the warm mix environment, uh, warm mix asphalt technology environment. Been on quite a few warm mix projects here in California. Um, one of the things to think about when we're when we're dealing with warm mix is it does change the characteristics of that mix when we're out in the field and under compaction. So um, the observation that um, uh, that that we're looking at a mix that will have a different compaction compaction windows. Uh, that's uh, for for both the lay down, the initial breakdown, intermediate rolling, and finish rolling, as well as where those um, tender zones reside. Right. Um, so yes, uh, the the question is, you know, your your uh, the inspectors out there, that's they're astute to under to 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 start to recognize that, and you see that. Unfortunately, the answer to what is the what is the temperature ranges to expect? I hate to do this, but uh, it depends uh, because a couple of the factors that we look at are the actual mix itself, the binder grades. So the things to keep in mind are um, the aggregate structure and the binder type and grade modifications. Um, what effects that going to have? Because obviously, if you have something with a stiffer binder, um, or if you have something with a softer binder, it's going to react a little bit differently. Um, also, when you look at the the temperature of the, um, uh, also you look at the actual warm mix technology. Um, if it's a foam, if it's a zeolite, if it's a chemical additive, they're all going to. Um, they're all going to work differently within the mix to make it workable at lower temperatures. The range of temperature reduction are going to be different with the different technologies. And even within a technology, let's say within a chemical additive, that range, that temperature range will be dependent on the amount of the additive that's used in the mix. Um, so uh, for example, I could, um, I've worked on some dense graded projects where um, where we were doing breakdown in the 230s and 240s for a conventional dense graded mix, a 64 minus 10 type A mix. Uh, and um, we were finishing it down at about 130, 140 degrees uh, finishing, but we actually had intermediate in the 185 range. So I'm sorry. I always do that. 135, 140 is finished. 185, we were doing intermediate. Um, so that's achievable. Um, if I had the same mix with less dosage, I may not have been able to go down that low. Um, and if I had a different technology, I may not have even been close to those going down that low. So I, I would say if you're if you have if there's a contractor out, the, here's the key. And this is um, shown in our next part as well that we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. Um, really what it's all about is getting density. Um, so how the question then becomes, how are you determining the density of the mix in place? If you're measuring it with a gauge or with cores, then you let that really determine what's the, let the contractor figure out what's the best um, operations, temperature zones to be compacting it in for that, um, to achieve that density. Um, let them figure it out. Density becomes the, the um, driving force for, for, for their operations. If you're working within the method specification, um, I think there's some, uh, I would say there's some, there's some temperature ranges that are identified in the standard specs for, for Caltrans that, are um, that are okay, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those mixes can't be compacted at lower temperatures. So I would say if you've got density, which most folks should be requiring a density number, 
let that drive really what the the temperature ranges are and let the contractor figure out um, what's the best way to get those. Keith, was there another question? That was it. This uh, just the warm mix uh, questions, and and uh, I think I think that makes good sense. So we've got it on record. And if you'd like so, to segue to your your next presentation, Brandon, please please proceed. Will do. Thanks, Keith. So there is another. What is that other? And this is really the um, we're gonna just share with you um, the um, asphalt mix um, that are available for local agency use. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the, with the Caltrans or especially up here in Northern California, um, and I know there are some in Southern California like, um, like uh, Dave down in, in, in San Diego, uh, County of San Diego, um, that use Caltrans as their primary specification. The local agency spec is um uh is is available for use um based off of the section 39 it's really a good plug and play spec uh but really focused for local agencies so what we're going to do is we're going to go over that um we're going to talk about um who's developing it how it was how it came about and then also what are some of those key things that make it really friendly use for local agencies and 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 why agencies should really consider moving towards the uh, more adoption of, of this specification. So first off, I need to acknowledge really this, this uh, presentation, th this portion of the presentation uh, really couldn't happen without um, Dr. John Harvey and Eric Updike from the City and County Pavement Improvement Center. Uh, they have been wonderful uh, stewards of of this effort to, to create a super paved specification for local agencies. So um, they've been committed to, through their, through their center, um, to helping local agencies uh, with their asphalt technical needs. And if you haven't heard about them, I'm gonna introduce a little bit about who they are and what they do. Um, and so a lot, of the, a lot of the content here in the following slides um, was helped out and provided, provided from them at CCPIC. So the City and County Pavement Improvement Center, this is a, a, an organization that operates under uh, the University of California Pavement Research Center at UC Davis under their director, uh, Dr. John Harvey. And I know many of you know who he is, uh, but if you don't, it's a good person to, to know and you should because CCPIC really was founded as a, as a, um, as a help for local agencies. They are sponsored by the League of California Cities, uh, CSAC and the County Engineer Association. So, so for those of you in the local government, um, your, your organization is helping, helping, um, helping form and fund and provide governance for, for this center. Um, obviously, uh, UC Pavement Research Center as well as Tech Transfer over at Berkeley. And then finally, uh, there's university partners. It's not to, not just UC, University of California, but also the CSUs uh, play a role. Um, Chico, Long Beach, and of course uh, my my uh, my favorite uh, state university, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, well, what is CCPIC? And it really, it's a technical resources. So for all of you local agency folks out there um, wanting to understand more about pavements. Um, and best ways to manage your one of your largest assets in your um, in your city and county, which is the roadway infrastructure. Um, CCPIC is really something to consider and to look look at. Um, their mission is to work with all of you in local government, uh, really to to improve your your asset uh, of of roads. Um, and really, what do they want to do? They want to make sure that that as uh, agencies that you're getting the most out of your number one asset, making sure that they, they perform, they're efficient and they're sustainable. So the scope of the CC pick really is, uh, really is around these, these, these four tenants. It's about sharing technical information, 
um, providing um, technical support, uh, you know, being a resource. Uh, so think of it as um, where where many agencies in the in days gone by would have very uh, sophisticated engineering firms that did all their own research, all their own testing, had their own labs. Um, a lot of that is no longer the case. And so they are now because they are now uh, 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 supported by your um, by your agency, a uh, supported research and resource entity for you to assist with with uh, your needs. And then also research and development. You know, there are a lot of efforts to to research pavements, um, but sometimes those may may not be what you're looking for at the for local needs. And so, as since they are connected with the UC Pavement Research Center, there's a way for local government to to come together and find find um, conduct some research that will uh, be more appropriate for for their specific needs at the at the local level. So, really, what is this other? And it's really a um, it's called Super Pay for Local Government HMA LG. Um, for most of you that are familiar with uh, the Caltrans specification, that's really what this is based around. It really, it, it really, um, it really complements the Section 39. Uh, you know, it complements the Caltrans standard spec, and it's really a replacement of Section 39. Same, written the same way. A lot of the same key uh, characteristics in 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 section, you know, in in that standard spec book, but it does create a specification that's, uh, I believe most of us believe are more appropriate for local use. There was a technical committee that included um, uh, both agencies as well as the university partners for CCPIC and us at, at Cal App and other industry stakeholders also were involved from um, a review and input. Just wanted to make sure that um, the CCPIC folks wanted to make sure that um, industry uh, is aligned with with what they were doing in the specification, and that you know that um, it was a practical spec that the the producers and contractors in the state could meet and would be willing to to meet to meet. Um, just really right out of the gate, it's not for use on the state highway system or national highway system NHS routes in your in your locality. So keep that in mind because. Um, I know a lot of you uh, recently may have had some um, some determinations by uh, FHWA in regards to what what um, routes within your jurisdiction are in the national highway system. Keep that in mind when we start to look at these specifications as well. While it's not approved today, uh, there is an effort to to look to see if we can get this specification adopted for use on the on NHS. Um, so something that, that we're hoping will will come out in the future. So let's let's look at um, let's look at what that mixed criteria is, uh, the super paved criteria, and how it differs from what we have in the Caltrans section 39. And so really what we're doing here is we still have those same three eighths, half inch, three quarter inch um, nominal maximum aggregate size mixes, but instead of the grading bands that we're used to seeing in the old section 39 under V mix designs, they're based off of the Asphalt Institute MS2. And so that is the really the whole super paid in the Caltrans specification and in this LG specification, it's all focused on that Asphalt Institute MS2 uh, methodology for super paid mix design. Also in this mix criteria, we, they're now, we don't just have that 185 gyration mix. There are three different mixes that are available in the LG specification. Uh, we looked at the design levels uh, for um, uh, the Asphalt Institute, as well as the highway design manuals when we started to consider um, those mix design uh, different mix designs uh, that are available for use. And then obvious, and then also um, there have been some adjustments to the aggregate quality requirements for each one. Um, 
for example, you know, as I mentioned before, there is a very stringent um, crush count requirement um, for the um, for the 85 gyration mix that Caltrans uses. Um, in some locales, that may be very difficult to get. And from a local agency use, maybe if you're using it on a low volume road, you don't need to be a, that, you don't have to have that, um, that uh, significant crush count requirement. And in those cases, maybe you're, you're uh, in a low volume road or something that's gonna be more of an environmental um, failure mode. Uh, we're not gonna worry too much about having those crush counts. Also, if you're in the rural area and you don't have that material, this gives an allowance for uh, for what the local materials may may have. So looking at different aggregate quality requir requirements for the levels. So let's look at the different levels that we see in that gyration uh, for, those, for those mixes. And here are the gyration requirements. Level three, I wanna start there first because what level three is, is what we see in section 39. It's that 85, 4% air voids, high crush count mix is really good for um, heavy trafficked arterials, highway systems, interstates, right? Um, but as we mentioned, um, for a lower volume, lower traffic road, uh, we don't necessarily need that, that uh, robust of a mix. And we have a different, the, the failure mode may not be traffic. It's probably more environmental. So what do we do? How do we, how do we improve um, the mix's performance environmental? Remember the stability and the durability curves? We want to have a little bit more durability, and we get that by increasing the asphalt content. So what we did here is for the level one and level two, um, we've changed the number of gyrations. We've changed the air void content with the intent of Let's let's bump up the uh, the asphalt. Uh, find ways to create a mix that has a little bit more asphalt in it, and so that's why we see those two. Um, and actually, for that level one, it's really all traffic up to seventy. Really, it's less than seven point five. So just remember, lower air voids, lower gyrations. That's going to help us increase that binder content and address um, durability um, concerns for the mix. Some other things that we look at too is the material criteria. Uh, we have wrap, we have a maximum allowed binder replacement uh, is now up to 25% from 15% that we've seen in previous books. Um, so there's there's that. And then also we have line treatment, liquid anti-strip. Um, those are based on the aggregate quality. Uh, so it's not necessarily a requirement unless our Mixture testing, remember that's the Hamburg testing for this LG shows that uh, that might be beneficial. And then warm mix asphalt is an, is an option for, for the contractor. Uh, verification, um, this is a big one because uh, when we start to move away from that Caltrans section 39, that single mix, um, Caltrans isn't going to be verifying those mixes. So in, in, in creating these two additional mixes for use by local agencies, there has to be a verification program. Uh, now, what, what it's done is a um, little bit more open-ended for the agency to figure out the best way to do it. But something to think about is uh, agency, if they, if they so choose, can go ahead and um, perform the JMF testing themselves, or they can accept JMF testing that was done on another project or maybe even from another agency within the past 24 months for that mix. So a little bit more flexibility on what a verification looks like, um, but more than likely in using these, that would be have to, something that the agency is going to have to consider is what's what's an appropriate level of verification that, that they would like. Um, in some cases, uh, maybe the verification is uh, a simple review of the mix design and conformance to the specification, and then we go to construction. That's a valid way to do it as well because you're going to be doing a production startup evaluation um, while they've simplified the pro the pro the pro uh, the testing requirements. Um, it's still there, and that could be a way to 
to do some verification testing in, as part of the product product production startup evaluation. Um, also, we see uh, production quality control re requirements and even acceptance requirements. I, you know, I, I think one of the big takeaways from the Caltrans specification is they have that huge list of um, of testing that's required for acceptance testing. And we know that what we were hearing from local agencies is that that was a huge burden uh, to try to set up and conduct all of that testing. And what the LG specification really did is it it really pared that list down to really the key uh, the key quality uh, characteristics that are necessary for the aggregates in the mix uh, that that have historically been tied to performance. So when we look at this from a um, LG perspective, what are we focusing on? What's your mix voids? What's your binder content? What's your uh, passing the 200 in place density? You know, it's those types of just key um, testing uh, that we, we know works. So then also we have um, as part of this, more flexibility on smoothness. This has a 12 foot straight edge, but there's no reason if if an agency likes to use the California profile graph that that could be used as well. Um, and then also in here, it is a compaction, uh, a density specification. Um, we're not looking at it for for really small project, but for for just about uh, most of your overlays, really having a some sort of density requirement in there. And then the other part is, is as you all know, California re requires, uh, the Caltrans standard spec requires density be measured off of cores. And we know that there's a lot of local agencies out there that don't want to put cores in their pavements, completely understand um, that concern. Uh, and so what this specification is, it, it really allows the contract, the, the um, agency in putting together these specifications to determine if they want to use cores or if they want to use gauges for determining in place density. I think the other benefit for this specification is it's really self-contained standalone. Um, there's not really a lot of anything else that you really need to do to the specification to use it. Uh, go ahead and you can put it into your special provisions as a replacement for section 39. Um, it's really meant to be, it was based off of Caltrans, but the way it's written in a way that um, it, that it could be utilized with, um, with Green Book or put into place with just agency standard specifications. Um, and then they, CCPIC will provide support for usage and implementation. So if as an agency you wanted to use the specification, um, they're more than happy to walk you through and help you put together, uh, help you um, put it into your specifications. Um, if you need some help with training of your engineers or even on the project about the use of the specification, they're more than happy to help out with that as well. And possibly even some, some um, field evaluations for your first time through using the specification. Now, for those that are in the San Francisco Bay Area, if you if you remember a little bit earlier, one of the key people in the development of this LG specification with CCPIC was Frank Farshidi from the city of San Jose. So this specification really um, is very similar to what Frank had, Frank and, and Henry Lee over there in the lab, what they have implemented for the city of San Jose. Um, so if you have any questions in regards to does this work, what's the experience with this specification, um, I'd go ahead and reach out to either Frank or Henry because they've been using this for now, I believe, three, three to four years now. It's been in their projects um, going in, out to construction, and they've had some very good positive uh, um positive things to say about it. There's also been some other ag agencies in the East Bay, as well as Stock city of Stockton that have used similar specifications to the LG specification with, with very good success as well. So if you're interested in doing this, reach out to uh, the city and county pavement improvement center. They are uh, just so when you go and click on that 
that little uh, link there on the left for the CC pick, that's what their uh, what their page looks like. So you know you're at the right place. Um, the nice thing about their about their center is they have this specification. They also have other specifications that are available on their on their website um, related to tack coats and um, compaction. But they also provide a bunch of training opportunities. Uh, they also have uh, best practice guidance documents on on pavements, on life cycle costs, uh, compaction temperatures. So you know that um, like a multi cool, you know that's that's a great compaction temperature for out there in the field. So all of that is available at the CCPIC. Also, I'm gonna put in a little bit of a plug for them on they have um, a certificate pro program that they are providing for um, for agencies and, and others that are involved related to, to pavements. Um, one of their courses uh, is related to um, asphalt mix design, primarily super paved. So what I went over here in about 45 minutes, um, I actually teach that course and that's like an eight hour course. So I get really into the nitty gritty detail thing. So if you're really interested in that on um, about uh, UCP or I mean about um, super paid mix designs, feel free to take that course. I think it's offered once or twice a year, um, but that's something that, I, that I've been involved with. But they have a whole bunch of other training opportunities on all aspects of asphalt pavement, pavement maintenance, and um, even your um, uh, all of that. So something to keep in mind and um, contact them if you if you have any questions or would like that. So I think at this point, I'll go ahead and open up if there's any questions related to the LG spec and its usage. So you Perfect. folks have any questions, just raise your hand and or type them into chat. Uh, Robert, you have some? Uh, yeah, Brandon. Brandon, what uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. What are uh, from the contractor's point of view? What are the additional methods that will need to take place if you are a contractor uh, working within a local agency uh, dealing with superpave on the testing side? From the acceptance side. From uh, from uh, as far as testing on site for the contractor on the contractor side. Oh, quality, quality control testing for the contractor? Correct. Yeah. So, um, so it also has a reduced, um, it's not so much frequency isn't changed, but the, um, the types of testing that's required is also um, uh, reduced from what we see in the section 39 back to really the primary uh, uh, characteristics that we're looking for back to gradation, binder content, air voids, um, and uh, in place density. Um, there are some characteristic testing that we see, but not nearly as long of a list as we have in section 39. Hamburg testing, it really depends on which level we use. So if you're at level three, which is the 85, there's a lot more um, Hamburg testing that might be required in there, but the other ones, it's really just a design test. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, Robert, thank you for putting up the, the link for that uh, CC pick so all of you can, can uh, go straight to it. Well, Brandon, that was just an absolute ton of information, no pun intended, and um, uh, Appreciate all of the work in, in today's session and in our previous session as well. Um, we do have these well recorded and so they will um, be available um, on Granite Rock's YouTube channel here in the coming weeks. We'll have them tidied up and, and ready to go. So if there are no further questions, uh, then I will um, again, thank you very much, Brent. Brandon, and we will uh, bid everybody adieu. This concludes our uh, Tech Talk series for 2022. We hope it was a benefit to you, the listener. Please 
fill out today's survey and any of the other surveys and uh, let us know how we can make this better for you and what new topics you'd like us to address. We will find those experts and provide them for you. Be safe, everyone. Rock on. Thank you.